Church, our midweek Bible study here at 7 o'clock. We had a blessed meeting on Sunday, thankful that we could do that, thankful for everyone that tuned in and met with us there. All of our services are all on our YouTube account, they're on the Facebook page, you can always go back and visit them. And we're talking about sermons going back a couple of years, and so guest speakers and everything. So I hope you'll avail yourself to them in your downtime, in this quiet time, that you'll use it as a chance to catch up on maybe on some Sundays that you missed or some Wednesday nights. And thank the Lord that we have this opportunity. And uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll have a couple of announcements and a few songs. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you that we can have church. But we thank you for loving us and uh, preparing this truth for us tonight that we're about to receive from your word. Lord, we look forward to the singing. We look forward to how it will minister to our hearts and our souls. And Lord, we look forward to just um, catching a glimpse of your beauty in the word of God tonight. And so, Lord, I pray just that would happen and that you'd minister to us. And Lord, that you'd grow us and uh, change us from within. Lord, help us to see if there's any wicked way in us. And Lord, break our pride. Help us to be humble, that we might deal with it and let you minister to us. Lord, that we wouldn't be self-righteous and stuck in our way. But truly, Lord, we'd see ourselves as Isaiah did. Woe is me, for I am undone. And so, Lord, help us to do those things and minister to us like only you can. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. I've got a couple prayer requests I wanted to share with you tonight. I also want to encourage you uh, to message us and let us know if there's a prayer request that we can make live and public right now. And um, I'd ask you to pray for Sandy. Sandy had a fall. We believe she broke a rib. And so obviously breathing and coughing and sneezing, everything will hurt when that happens. So please pray for Sandy. And uh, Sandy, we want you to know if you're watching right now, we love you. We thank God for you and your service. And just pray, we're praying for you to get better. We can't wait uh, to be all back together because we know that this is wonderful being able to meet like this. But we also realize there's nothing like getting together in the church house and um, just being near one another as the body of Christ. It ministers to us. It heals us, I believe. And uh, yeah, just being together. And so there's some things that can't happen when we're separated like this. So we're praying that we'll soon be able to be back together. Please pray specifically for the lost. That they would tune in. And that they would receive the salvation uh, message. and Maybe even get saved. Uh, of course we've got a big weekend coming up with Easter. And praying that uh, folks would tune in. I've got some family members that aren't believers. And perhaps God can pique their curiosity. They would tune in and they might just have an open heart and trust Christ as their Savior. So please pray. Uh, there's lost people that are curious and they're stranded at home, bored, looking for things to do. There's only uh, so much you can watch on Netflix and you feel like you need to have a bath in bleach. And, uh, and then you start searching for some righteousness, for some light. And lost people can do that. God can use this time to reach lost people. So please pray for them. Pray for our service this Sunday, Easter Sunday. Pray for tonight's service. And uh, we'll thank you for that. We've got a uh, uh, great God doing great things. And uh, we're thankful that we're able to serve him. And again, like I said, message my wife's phone if you have something tonight. We can add it in here. It's 214-629-4248. And, uh, or just put it on Facebook there. Let us know you're there as well, and that will be an encouragement to us. Let's take our hymn books tonight and turn to page 472. 472. We'll sing Follow On. Follow On. Follow, 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 I will follow. 
461. 461. Stepping in the light. Stepping in the light. 461. <laughs> So when you sing at home, you'll be able to turn to the page. And it's something that you'll have long after we're back at church. And you'll be able to um, uh, just enjoy it as part of your devotions. I think that's a good part of having devotions, is being able to sing some good scriptural songs, as well as read the Word of God, as well as pray. And so it'd be a good investment, I think, for everybody at home. BibleTruthMusic.com. Get yourself a hymn book. You'll be able to join in better and enjoy it with us, and uh, you'll have it for years to come. Great hymn book uh, for you there. Higher Ground, page 447. <laughs> I'm doing them right now, but uh, I'm hoping he didn't read this one just before we this all happened. But uh, no doubt there's some things here we need to pray about. He says here, the devil has been attacking very hard lately. We have seen problems in each of the works uh, that threaten the growth. In each instant, we have seen God take care of the problems in his own way. As always, we trust him for the solutions. He has attacked Marcelino in Madrano very hard. 
his truck that he depends on to help him make a living has gone down. Andreas and I are helping him to get it going again. The diesel engine went out. This has been a hard trial for he and his wife, but with our support, he has been encouraged. So pray for Marciano there. Marcelino, sorry. The devil has also attacked Andreas. 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 Andre. Yes, Andreas. Uh, and his family in several ways and tried to discourage them. The worst trial they have faced is with their daughter. She was expecting a little girl but had problems with preeclampsia. They had to take the baby at 26 weeks. <coughs> Her little lungs were not developed enough and she only lived two days. This has been a very hard trial for the whole family, but Andreas and Gabby have found the grace of God sufficient. Amen? Amen? Please keep them in your prayers. The devil has also attacked Mandy and I in several ways. I told Andreas that when the devil attacks this hard, it is because we are doing something right. Amen? Amen. We are looking forward to some great victory soon with the baptisms and organizing some of the works into missions. At the present, we are facing the trial of the coronavirus. The government has closed the schools and is telling the churches to temporarily halt services. Since I am a diabetic, the brethren are also asking me not to venture out and risk getting the virus. I will use the time to catch up on some writing I need to finish. Pray that this won't last long and we can soon get back on track. And so there's some things there to pray about. Why don't we have a prayer right now for the Delaney's. Father, we thank you for the Delaney's. We thank you for their ministry in Panama. We pray, Lord, that you would bless, help Brother Delaney, especially keep him safe, uh, Lord, uh, from any sickness or illness here, especially not getting the virus. Help him, of course, catch up on his writings, but Lord, please find a way for him to be able to still minister to the folks uh, through the different works that they have their hand in there. And uh, Lord, we thank you that the testimony here is clearly that your grace was sufficient for Andreas and Gabby. We continue to pray for their just emotional healing and all that. And that, Lord, uh, you would work that together for good somehow. And, Lord, maybe even bless them with another trial. We thank you for that. And then, Lord, of course, help Marcelino help his truck situation there. And, uh, Lord, we'll thank you for all that. Bless in our Bible study tonight. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's take our Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians 10.13, if you would. 1 Corinthians 10.13. It's a great Bible verse, amen? We've been looking at truths, uh, really, that every Christian ought to know, and some famous verses, really, that every Christian ought to get a hold of, that can really transform our thinking and can really give us a foundation, a body of belief, so that when we go out into the world, or when we hit hard times, or even when we hit really good times and we're tempted to get away from God and go on our own, that we'll still have this foundation, this connection, back with our Christian roots and heritage. And we understand uh, some key principles that we can continue to govern our life on. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, a great verse here. It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Father, thank you for your word. I pray you bless our time in it now, in Jesus' name, amen. This is probably the greatest promise about temptation, amen? Great verse on it. When you have trials, when you have struggles, when you have hardship, when you find your flesh lusting after the world, or the things of the flesh, or the things that the devil offers up there, this is a great promise that God will not suffer you above that you're able, but he will provide a way to escape it. We're going to unpack that a little bit tonight. 
But God won't leave you out there without any help. Amen? We understand that the struggle is real. Each of us is having a hard time. Why else do we need to pray for one another? Amen? Why else is our midweek Bible study and prayer time so important? So that we can bring our needs to one another, to the body of Christ. Pray for one another. Because we're all struggling with different besetting sins, different temptations. And God says here, there is no temptation that He won't give you the ability to handle with you and Him together working through it. And that's a great promise there. That's something we can really hitch our boat to, so to speak, so that we don't drift off into rough waters. But there's, there's many occurrences in our daily lives that we would call common. Things that we do just naturally. For Stephen, that would be eating. Amen? He doesn't have to think about eating. It just comes naturally. For most of us, it's things like walking. We don't think about it. I mean, if you have a sore knee, you might think about it. But if you have a healthy set of legs and you're not going too far, generally you don't think about walking. Generally you don't think often about eating. These are just natural things that occur. You don't think about communicating unless you struggle in that area. You just, you learn to talk. You learn to give facial expressions and it just comes naturally. They're so regular in our life that we just don't give them much thought. Can I say tonight that temptation in our lives is that way as well? Temptation is often so regular in our lives that we don't give it much thought. We just I think we just learn to deal with it. Can I caution all of us to be aware there a little bit? I mean, it's good that we develop natural spiritual reflexes against the things that the devil throws at us. But I think we also need to continue to be aware and continue to face, because we will continue to face temptations in our life. Amen? And we don't want to get caught off guard. Amen? Be sober, be vigilant. Remember, the Bible teaches us here. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about temptation, unpack this verse here a bit tonight. What does it mean? What does temptation mean? Well, when you think of temptation, what do you think of? Good or bad? Bad. Bad, right? Just automatically. It's got a bad connotation. If I'm being tempted to do something, surely it must be bad. It's like that verse in the Bible that talks about the Stephanus family. They have addicted themselves to the ministry of what? Saints. Of the saints. Oh, well, wait a minute. That sort of causes you to pause for a second because when you hear the word addiction, you automatically think good or bad. Bad, bad right? But there we see it's good. It's, it's in the context. I think it's, it's in who is doing it to you. Uh, uh, that word in, in and of itself, though, is amoral. It's neither good nor bad. We sort of have to look at where it's coming from. And that's why I say in the Christian life, temptation comes regularly, and often we just deal with it. I mean, we've dealt with it before, and we'll deal with it again. But beware. Um, it, it, we got a sneaky, sly, cunning, divisive enemy that is relentless. And he's going to be throwing things at us that I think we need to make sure that we're, we're careful about. So, the word is translated in different ways. Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 6. Let's look at this word. Parasmos. Parasmos. That's the Greek word behind temptation. Parasmos. All right? You there in John chapter 6? Parasmos in the Greek is translated, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, to temptation. There had no temptation or parasmos. All right? John chapter 6, we're going to see the word again here. 
translated from parasmos to prove. Prove. All right, John 6, 5 says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes, saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him. That's where the word parasmos is. For he himself knew what he would do. So here, put yourself in Philip's shoes for a minute. Philip has just been with the multitudes, but he's traveling with Jesus. And like everybody else, Philip's mind is a little bit blown by all the miracles that he's seen Jesus do. Jesus has done so many miracles that the crowd had grown to such a great extent that they had to get onto a boat and they had to sail across the Sea of Tiberias to the other side just to get a little bit of elbow room and a little bit of space from these massive crowds that are growing. They get over to the other side of the Sea of Tiberias. That's where we are in John chapter 6 and verse 5. Jesus lifted up his eyes and he saw what? Just a great company of people. Now, Jesus is always interested in growing us. Mm -hmm. He's always interested in testing us, proving us, not tempting us to do wrong, but uh, strengthening us so that we can do more right in the future. Now, we know Philip had some great duties ahead of him. Amen? What did Philip do? You remember? Acts. Remember? He was told to go from Samaria to the desert. Yes. And he, remember? He reached the Ethiopian Union. Jesus had some great works for him to do. What was Jesus trying to do? Strengthen him. Parasmos. Uh, can be also translated temptation. Was it bad for Jesus to say, hey, Philip, I got a question for you. Why are you asking me a question? Because I want you to think, and I want you to get strengthened through this. I'm, I'm trying to work on your faith right now. What do you think I should do with all these people? It's good, isn't it? Let's look at another way that it's translated, the word here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13.5. Look at 2 Corinthians 13.5. Second Corinthians 13 5 says examine yourselves all right that word parasmos is behind that word examine huh. same word that's translated temptation in 1st Corinthians chapter 10 is also translated prove in John chapter 6 is now translated examine in 2 Corinthians 13. It's got different meanings to it. It's really got the same meaning to it, though. Uh, here, it's, a, it's a, a time for self-reflection. Let's read the verse. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. The Bible says, Paul is saying, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? And of course, the next verse says, they realize, uh, he says, I trust that you, you know you're not reprobates. I trust that you realize you're not cast off, that you really are a child of God. But I want you to examine yourself, or I want you to take some time of self-reflection. Boy, that really fits in with John chapter 6. When Jesus is talking to Philip and he's saying, I, I'm doing this to strengthen you. That really fits into 1 Corinthians chapter 10 where it says uh, temp temptation. Uh, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. So in other words, the temptations on our life are, can very well be a means of strengthening. Can very well be a means or a time of fortifying or shoring up our spiritual life or examining our spiritual life. Amen? Definitely not a bad connotation anymore, is it? It's a good connotation. The word, like I said earlier, is amoral. 
we can learn what the word temptation means in the Bible by who is doing the tempting. Okay? Look with me in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Here we see a common story. The devil is going to what? Tempt. He's going to tempt Jesus. Jesus, right? <laughs> Don't think he won't tempt you if he tempted our Lord. Don't think you don't need to be aware of temptation to lust, temptation to be prideful, temptation to be bitter, temptation not to forgive. If he tempted our Lord, he'll tempt you. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, can I say, that wasn't a time to be strengthened. He wasn't led up there to be... He was the Son of God. He wasn't led up there as a time of self-evaluation or self-examination, was he? Not, that wasn't the devil's intent. That's why when I say, you read the Word of God and you look at who is doing the tempting, you can realize whether or not it's a good temptation or it's a bad temptation. Alright, so he was led up of the Spirit to be tempted of the devil when he had fasted 40 days, 40 nights. He was afterward a hungered when, and when the who came? Tempter. The tempter came. To him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Tempting him to do right or tempting him to do wrong? wrong. You can you can you can you need to learn to discern if it's coming from God, it would be more of a test, not a temptation to do evil, right? It'd be a test. It'd be a time of strengthening. But if it's coming from Satan then it's obviously an attack. It's a temptation to draw away from God. Right? Satan's trying to lure in Jesus here. Why? Because if he can get him to sin, then there's no Savior. There's no sacrifice. There's no substitute. So it's a temptation for wrong. Draw away from the will of God. Look with me in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. Right back at the beginning of the word... Genesis means beginnings, right back in the beginning of the Word of God. Genesis chapter 22. You say, Pastor, I thought you were going to end up here because I'm pretty sure the Bible says God tempted Abraham. Genesis 22, verse 1 says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abram. Abraham. And said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So does God tempt? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you're not sure. Should I answer? Yes, God tempts. He said God did tempt Abraham. All right? Why did God tempt Abraham? What was the purpose behind it? We know he tempted Philip. Why? To grow. Parasmus, which is the Greek word behind it. John chapter 6, verse 5. Translated prove, which means to... Strengthen him. That's why he tempted Philip. To strengthen him. To fortify his faith. Because he had some great work for him to do in the future. Why did he tempt? Or why did Paul say, examine yourselves? Time of self-reflection. So why, why do you think God's tempting Abraham? Could be for the very same reason. Amen. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Gives us the reason why. He tempted Abraham in Genesis chapter 22. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 17. The Bible says here, By faith Abraham, now I like this, 
when he was tried. tried. So temptation, I understand, has a negative connotation. But it means to try. It means to prove. It means to test. It means to cause you to examine. Amen? You've got to have a fuller uh, idea of what it means. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting that, God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received in him a figure, him in a figure. So why did he tempt them? He had a great work for him to do, didn't he? He, he wanted to bless him. He wanted to bless Isaac. He wanted to strengthen him. Why? So that he could reach the potential that God wanted him to reach. God's going to tempt you. God's going to try you. God's going to prove you. God's going to cause you to examine yourself. Why? So that he can bless you. So he can help you reach your potential. Amen? you got to go through hard times. You got to go through strengthening times. The journey can't be easy or else you'll never be up for the task. That's right. Amen. So the meaning of temptation not bad. It's good. It means different things. You got to consider who is doing the tempting though, and when God does it, he does it for your good for, to the idea that he can strengthen you for the job that he's calling you to do in the future. Let me give you some reasons about temptation. Um, um, James chapter 1, if you would. James chapter 1. <clears throat> There's a great passage here talking about God tempting us. This is the, the one that people get in the discussion about as to whether or not God tempts or God doesn't tempt. Can I say the Bible clearly says here that God doesn't tempt you for evil. Right. And you're taking it out of context when you say God doesn't tempt. You're not finishing the sentence. Because right. God does tempt. God did tempt Abraham. To prove him. To strengthen him. To get him ready. And he will tempt you as well. But he won't ever tempt you to do Wrong or evil. James 1.12 Blessed is the man that what? Endureth. Endureth temptation. So we got to go through it. You got to go through the proving time. You got to go through the fire. If you want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. So I'm not going to get it easy? No, you're not going to get it easy. You think Abraham had it easy when he'd been praying all these years for his child? Finally has the child and God whispers in his ear and says, Now I want you to take that knife and I want you to plunge it into your only son and uh, sacrifice him to me? You imagine the extreme uh, uh, guilt and, and the tearing of his heart and you know, he's torn between his passion for God and his love for his own child. How are you going to get used, Abraham? I'm going to have to get tested. I'm going to have to be a time of evaluating my own spirituality and trusting God. Uh, God does that. So, blessed is a man that endureth the temptation. Doesn't quit halfway through, but continues to go through the temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man with evil. That's what it means there. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So we have to understand, God has a motive. He's got a reason for creating you. Satan also has some motivations. God has an intention, what he intends to do with your life, and Satan intends to do some things 
with your life as well. God might allow Satan to tempt you in your life, but understand when it comes from Satan, it's always an attack to try to draw you away from the will of God. And so you have to discern, is this from God or is this from the devil? Either way, you're going to have to endure the temptation to get blessed, whatever the temptation is. Now, uh, the reasons for the temptation are either, write this down if you would, to fulfill your flesh or to fortify your faith. <laughs> if it's coming from Satan, if it's coming from your flesh, or if it's coming from the world, it's going to be uh, trying to fulfill your flesh. It's going to be a lustful appetite that you have that Satan is trying to tempt you with. He's trying to offer to you. And you've got to analyze the situation. Amen? I think I'd far rather have the temptation that I'm going through fortify my faith. Wouldn't you? I mean, I'd far rather use the temptation in my life as an opportunity to examine just how much do I believe in God. Just how much can I claim, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that there is no temptation uh, that, that uh, isn't outside of the realm of humanity and that every man has been tried the same as me and God won't let me go through anything that him and I can't endure together and he won't give me a way of escaping it either. It makes you examine yourself. Fortify your faith. Strengthen you. Prove you. Test you. Love this verse. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Boy, that's a key verse when you're going through a hard time. When you're going through a trial. How are you supposed to discern? Sometimes it's hard. Old smutty face is tricky. Boy, he's pretty good at this game. Trying to trick you and lure you away from the will of God and God's plan for your life. Here's, here's a tip. Submit yourself to God. Rest in Him. Wait patiently. Trust God. Same time, resist the devil in anything that doesn't seem right. And the devil will leave you alone. Understand that temptations aren't there to make your life harder. They're there to make you stronger. Amen? <coughs> Could we call coronavirus a temptation? Biblically. We could. Could we call a coronavirus a trial? We could. Could we call it a time of strengthening? Yep. Could we call it a time of fortification? Yeah, can we call it a time of self-examination? Mm -hmm. Sure we could. Could we use it as an opportunity to submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, and trust that he will flee from us, and it will be a time of fortifying our faith? Yeah. Yep. yeah. We could also use it as a time of fulfilling our flesh, couldn't we? Mm -hmm. Boy, you sure can waste your time in, these, in this trial that we're going through. All this free time, I sure could write a lot of blogs cutting people down. I sure could pick up the phone a lot and gossip. Good night. Sure could watch a lot of wickedness on Netflix. Good night. Really fulfill the flesh. This trial that I'm going through isn't meant to make my life hard, though. It's meant to make me stronger. I gotta discern, okay, where is it coming from? Understand, God has allowed it. That's why we're going through it today. The devil's not in charge. God's in charge. It had to go across his desk. So I'm gonna use it as a time to fortify my faith. Secondly, the reason I have temptation is uh, to conform me to Christ. It could either be a time to cause me to crash or to conform me to Christ. Right? I mean, I could crash and burn 
in the midst of my trial that has come across God's desk that he knows full well about, that he has allowed into my life as an opportunity to prove me or allow me to examine my spirituality, I could very well crash and burn. Or I could allow it to conform me to Jesus Christ instead. Listen to Job's words. Job 23.10 He said, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. <laughs> he wrote that while he was in the midst of it. He hadn't even been restored yet. The devil said, there's got to be somebody I can tempt, somebody I can try, somebody I can prove, somebody I can check and see if their fortification is strong. Have you considered my servant Job? Yeah, let me at him. Oh, well, you just want him to fail, don't you? I sure do, the devil said. I sure do. Let me at him. And Job, Job in the midst of it says, oh... When he's tried me. When, when this is all over. I'm in the midst of it right now. But I still have my eyes on the goal. I still have my eyes on the prize. I still have my heart fixed toward heaven. I shall be conformed to Christ. I shall come forth as gold. You think he claimed that promise without even having read it? Yeah, because he knew the God of it. Temptation is given to us to destroy our pride and develop within us a patience. Let me say that again. Temptation is allowed by God to destroy our pride and to develop within us a patience. <laughs> pride. What a nasty word. <laughs> you sense it in everybody. But you hardly sense it in yourself. Everybody struggles with pride, but often you can't detect it in your own life. Other people can. So God's developed a way to get it out of you. He lets us go through trials. All with the intention of breaking down our pride and maturing us or developing in us. Patience. Look with me, if you would, in uh, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I love this. Don't you love it? It's the Bible. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Let me tell you a story while, while I'm turning there. David had a, a tr struggle with pride. King David. Remember, King David was the guy that said, at the time for kings to go to battle, I think I'll just stay home. And he caught himself looking out on the balcony and seeing a beautiful woman bathe. And he allowed the lust, the temptation, to steal his heart and affection away from what God would have him do in that situation. What would God have him do in that situation? Right? Submit himself to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee, right? Yeah, that's what God would have him do. That would have not fulfilled his flesh, but it would fortify his faith. But David, in his pride, thought, I want to take her to be my wife. In his pride, also took her husband, had him murdered. In his pride, sat on his throne, <clears throat> covering in his sin, when God told Nathan, you need to go have a talk with that boy. And Nathan said, let me tell you a story. There's a rich man and there's a poor man. This rich man had everything he could ever want, everything he could ever need. And there's this other poor man that really didn't have much anything, but he had a little lamb. And wouldn't you know, this rich man came along one day, and he decided, I want to have your lamb. And he took his lamb. And David heard this story from the prophet Nathan, and he said, why, I tell you, that guy is going to die, and he's going to have to pay back fourfold. Just wrath. And Nathan said what? You're the guy filled with pride. Boy, you're quick to judge others. 
You're quick to analyze the situation in other people's life, and you're also quick to fulfill your flesh and succumb to the temptation that God meant to fortify you and fortify your faith. This is what David said in Psalm 51 3. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. What happened? His pride was destroyed. He humbled himself. When faced with an even bigger trial that he had disappointed God, it broke him. He allowed himself to be broken. And God developed in, in him a measure of maturity so that he could go on and continue to lead the nation of Israel. Fantastic story. But pride, something we struggle with. Something that God is trying to break in each and every one of us so he allows us to go through struggles to break our pride. Mm -hmm. To develop within us a patience, a maturity, a trust, a fortification, a strengthening so that we can fulfill God's will in the future. Here's that verse. James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. <laughs> Woo! You mean really? I should be excited when I fall into many trials, James? Yep. Uh, you should. Why? Well, he goes on to say, knowing this, that the trying, we could also say temptation. That the trying of your faith worketh patience. patience. That's maturity. God's trying to break you and mold you and make you conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Temptations are designed to teach us to respond Biblically. David, he didn't respond so biblically the first time with Uriah and Bathsheba, did you? No, I didn't. But you did pretty good when Nathan got in front of you and said, Thou art the man. He said, I, I came to a point where I had to acknowledge my transgressions and that my sin was ever before me. It was broken. Boy, he just grew through leaps and bounds through that trial through that test. That's why God allows it in our life. Now, let me say this. Number three. How can we escape it? How can we deal? Let's talk about the escape that God promises here. Because this is the greatest promise about temptation right here. 1 Corinthians 10.13 There have no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. You all know what an architect is? He designs a building, like a house or a church. And by the way, church, we got our foundation prints done. Uh, he does, the engineer designed how the rebar is going to sit and how the, the pilings are going to sit, the piers and all that in the foundation. And praise the Lord, we got that seal on them. And uh, so we're ready to move forward as soon as this virus passes. <clears throat> but an architect, he designs the things that are necessary in a building. If he's designing a house, he says, okay, this is how the ceiling needs to be. This is how the walls need to be. This is how the windows need to be. Uh, very rarely, I don't think ever, you'll find a building that is designed without a door. A way of escape. God has promised us a way of escape such as is common to man, right? So when an architect designs a building, he designs something that is common to man, a door. <laughs> That's how we come in and out. We have a door. 
God said, I'll provide you a door to be able to escape in the time of your trials so that you, you and me, we can bear it together. Amen? You say, well, what is that door? Well, that door is obviously Jesus. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He also said, I am the door. So Jesus is the way of escape in the midst of temptation, not necessarily to get out of the trial, but to be able to endure and withstand during the trial. But can I also say, this verse is that way of escape. You say, how is this verse that way of escape? Well, you can use this verse, this promise, as a way to be able to endure the temptations by simply quoting it. By simply remembering it. This verse, like every other verse in the Bible, can be used as a weapon in the midst of a battle. Amen? Best thing you can do in the midst of a trial, start quoting scripture. Why? Because it's sharper than any two-edged sword. When you're going through a trial, when you're tempted by the devil to sin and to lust after something, pull out the old mighty word of God, quote 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that there have no temptation taken you, but such as is common. Remind yourself that you're not in a situation right now that hasn't been common to anybody else, and God said, I will help you out in the midst of it. Be like a weapon that way, wouldn't it? Just by remembering this verse. Just by quoting this verse, it'll be like a weapon. It can also be like a nurse during surgery. The nurses right now are some of the greatest heroes in America, in the world, dealing with the coronavirus. They're the ones that are on the front line. They're the ones whispering comforting words into the ears of the patients, saying, this is what you can expect, sir, madam. This is what medication we're giving you. This is what the doctor is going to try to do. This is what we found out. This is what you can expect in the future. All these words designed to bring you comfort, to give you some understanding. Can I say, let this verse speak softly to you in the midst of your trial, that there had no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear. You can almost hear the nurse's words there. Can I say that this verse can also be a shelter during a storm? When you're going through the midst of a trial, you're tempted to think, I'm in this storm all by myself. Nobody knows what it's like. But the Bible tells us here, that such as is common to man. Amen? You're not alone in the midst of the storm. Use it as a comforting passage. Can I also say that this verse is like a friend during a crisis? And we've all had friends that were there when we needed them. And that said something encouraging. And we bonded with. And this timeless promise can be that friend. The greatest promise about temptation is God's word telling you that you're not facing anything that I haven't myself faced. Isn't that great to know that Jesus Christ is somebody that can relate to you? Mm -hmm. Somebody who's felt what you felt in every area of your life? Hebrews 4.15 4, 4, says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, mm -hmm. like as we are, yet without sin. We can, we can talk to him as a friend about anything. In fact, Christ is the greatest counselor that any of us could ever wish or hope for. Hebrews 4.16 Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The greatest promise about temptation. Are you going to use it? 
Are you going to have it in your arsenal? Is it going to be maybe your life first where you feel like, I think that can help me. <laughs> I really think I can unpack that verse a time or two this next few weeks while I'm stuck at home. And when I'm tempted maybe to feel discouraged, depressed, feel sorry for myself, wonder if this is going to ever end. I wonder if God's in control. I wonder if the world will ever open up again. There hath no temptation taken. But such as is common to men. I love this. But God is faithful. He's faithful. God's faithful during this time. He'll not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. But will with this temptation also make a way to escape. That's Jesus. That's this verse. That you may be able to bear it. Use the word of God during this time to encourage yourself in the Lord. David found himself down. And David encouraged himself in the Lord when he was down. What are you going to do when you're tempted? Go to the word of God. Go to your knees. Go to the great counselor. Trust Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you now for your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that because we're saved, we have a Savior that we can run to, that we can cling to. We have a faith that can be fortified, can be strengthened, must be strengthened. And God, help us to see every trial, every hardship, every hard time that we're experiencing as another opportunity to grow in Christ and grow closer to you. Help us, Lord, not to disdain. Help us to be as Job was understanding that the trial came from you and you designed it to really bring us forth as gold. Help us to respond correctly, biblically. Help us to be uh, the light that this dark world needs in this time. Lord, bless this Easter week especially in our Facebook posts, the things we read, the things we say, the things that we talk about on the phone to be uplifting, to be edifying. Help us to pray for one another in the body of Christ. And help us, Lord, also to reach out to the lost during this time. They certainly are grieving as those that have no hope. And they certainly are filled with far more fear than your children will ever be filled with. And so, Lord, help us to use this time to reach out to them as well. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the sure promises in the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray.